Good, good afternoon, everybody, for joining us today on our webinar. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our webinar, The Investor Perspective, Challenges, Opportunities and Risks in the Post-COVID World for SMEs. This is the seventh in a series of strategic webinars we are holding with young Arab leaders. We've been a strategic collaborator with Pearl Initiative since 2018, and we are very grateful for this collaboration and their ongoing support. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with the Pearl Initiative, the Pearl Initiative is the leading and only independent nonprofit organization founded to promote the business case for the implementation of the highest standards of corporate governance, transparency and accountability across the Gulf region's private sector. Launched in 2010 in cooperation with the United Nations Office of Partnerships, the Pearl Initiative aims to convene businesses, decision makers and future young leaders to take the lead in promoting and adopting greater standards in corporate governance. Pearl Initiative engages with wider business ecosystem in the Gulf region, collaborating with over 30 regional universities and partnering with over 40 companies to collectively drive our mission forward. We work as a think tank and build data by publishing cutting edge research reports and case studies to inspire business change. The webinar we're holding today is being held as part of our micro governance in micro, small and medium sized enterprises, SME, MSMEs. Um, as you know, uh, these are considered the backbone of the regional economy and account for between 80% and 90% of registered companies across the region. However, the annual contribution to regional GDP does remain relatively low. As SMEs compete with each other in a saturated marketplace and strive to be both innovative, innovative and fiscally sustainable, they must understand the fact that implementing corporate governance is the key to facilitating their growth and success. The Pearl Initiative understands the necessity of good governance for small business success, and in 2017, we launched our Governance in SME program to help engage small businesses on the importance of corporate governance for positive economic outcomes. Good governance is flexible and can be fit and can be modified and tailored to fit particular businesses' needs. It is not meant solely for the realm of multinationals and large corporations, as is often perceived. SMEs will find that applying corporate governance policies and practices will help them build a stronger, more resilient and more profitable business. business. Um, we are pleased to hold this webinar to discuss how investors are viewing the risks for Gulf region SMEs in light of COVID-19, as well as the opportunities that remain for small business success. The threat of the COVID-19 pandemic across the globe has brought investors and SMEs to unprecedented situations in terms of investment opportunities and business approach. As a result, most of the SMEs, particularly those in trade and export, are brought to a virtual standard, standstill. The webinar will discuss current state of investment sector in the UAE and the Gulf, investments opportunities amidst the pandemic, how SMEs can attract investor appetite, the importance of corporate governance in investing and being invested among SMEs, and the investment outlook and what SMEs should prepare for. As I mentioned earlier, we are holding this webinar in collaboration with Young Arab Leaders. So just to give you an introduction about them, um, they are a not-for-profit organization founded during the World Economic Forum in 2004 under the patronage of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum, Vice President and Prime Minister of the UAE and ruler of Dubai. YAL seeks to leverage the capabilities and expertise of its strong regional network of members in order to catalyze the entrepreneurial and professional development of the next generation of leaders. Its mission and vision is to empower the next generation of leaders in the Arab world by developing a strong network of industry and business leaders to serve as mentors and role models to youth and entrepreneurs across the region. It does so by fostering entrepreneurship and innovation and creating a hub for new business investment opportunities. YAL has a mentors network and an advisors network and is engaged in community initiatives such as entrepreneurship workshop series, a mentorship program and weekend competitions and has a vast support network. Today's webinar is being presented by Mr. Amin bin Khalib. Uh, we are pleased to welcome Mr. Amin. He's a YAL member and senior portfolio manager at Camara Corp and will be facilitating our webinar today. Amin is an active member of Young Arab Leaders and joined Camara in 2017 as a senior portfolio manager. Prior to this, he served as a portfolio manager for General Pension and Social Security Authority in Abu Dhabi. And Amin has over 15 years experience of managing equities and fixed income portfolios across economic cycles with a predominant focus on emerging and frontier markets. Amin also has experience setting up an integrated front to back asset management process to oversee multi asset portfolios with large institutions, GP, SSA, among others. Um, this is obviously a webinar and um, we're holding these in lieu of our ability to hold in person events across the Gulf region. Um, obviously, it's a different feel and we are unable to have the interactivity that we have face-to-face -face interaction. However, we are trying to make these webinars as interactive as possible. So you'll notice that there is a panel um, 
on your page to submit questions to Amin. Um, these will be filed straight through to Amin and Amin can, will be answering those throughout the webinar or might save them to the end, depending on the approach he chooses to take. So um, please do feel free, to, free, free, feel free to use the webinar interface to virtually raise your hand and use the Q&A function to ask Amin questions. Um, handing over to Amin now. Once again, Amin, thank you so much for your time um, and your insights and committing to doing this for us. Good luck, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, uh, thanks Yasmin. Thanks, uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, I'd like to just uh, start um, start the webinar with a with a, a, a brief disclaimer. So the first one is um, you know, Chatham House rules apply to this uh, to this webinar. Just to highlight that uh, all um, all all the content and information received during this webinar can be uh, can be replicated without um, 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 without a, without mentioning the identity or affiliations of uh, of, um, of the participants in this in this webinar, my experience um, involves uh, mainly investing in businesses and uh, not running them day to day. Um, I am also not an epidemiolo epidemiologist or virologist, um, and of course, I I, I could be wrong. Um, the agenda, as highlighted by uh, by Yasmin earlier, will try to cover. Um, 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 the current state of the investment sector in the COVID-19 uh, COVID world, as well as the investment opportunities that could exist uh, in the middle of this pandemic, how SMEs can attract investor appetite, um, and also um, um, deal with uh, all, all, all the uh, investment queries going forward, um, and as well as the investment outlook and what to prepare for post-COVID. Uh, post so uh, just to highlight, since since COVID-19 has hit the region, uh, all the governments um, in, in in this part of the world have taken um, uh, drastic measures to uh, to curtail movement and to curtail the the, the pandemic expanding across uh, um, and and uh, reduce the infection the infection rates. Um, um, so predominantly, we focus on 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 the measures of of uh, in the UAE. Um, where before uh, before Ramadan started, um, most of um, the movement has been has been limited to only uh, uh, emergency movements and, uh, and by requirement. This would of course have a significant impact on retail activity. Um, and also to highlight that um, foreign travel restrictions have been have been put put in place quite uh, quite early on. Um, that would of course uh, have a significant impact on retail hospitality and um, as well as um, mass gatherings. So the event. Um, in, in, in media as well as tourism would have a significant impact. Schools, um, shops, and restaurants have been allowed to uh, to reopen gradually um, since the beginning of, of, of Ramadan with limited capacity and, of course, uh, social distancing measures in place. This would have a significant impact um, going forward, and we'll try to drill deeper into this. Um, the key here is that um, all of these measures um, had one single focus, which is uh, basically flattening the curve uh, of infection um, until we figure out what are the next steps with this virus and, and what treatments are in place. Um, how big are SMEs um, in, in, in the UAE? I think it's a, it's a fairly important question. There are different metrics to, uh, to measure an SME, uh, depending what you're looking at, but uh, the key here is uh, we've used um, the uh, Central Bank of UAE data and uh, the, the, the Ministry of Economy. Um, given uh, it's pretty much clear what is the importance of tourism and travel uh, to the UAE and to the, 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 the Dubai economy. So tourism and travel in general generates around 45% of, of, of uh, non-oil GDP, um, according to Dubai statistics. Um, we all know that uh, by now it's been public that uh, um, the Expo 2020 has been delayed, and um, the anticipated upside from that and the recovery that will be uh, generated from the Expo has been delayed till next year. Um, and to clarify, uh, according to the data and the numbers that we have, 94% of, of, of uh, total comp companies operating in the UAE are um, SMEs. Um, these have uh, the 94% is in broad numbers, so counting the number of companies. 73% uh, of these are involved in wholesale and, uh, and retail trade. 
Um, and obviously, when you have a, a big curtailment of, of, of movement, uh, as well as limited activity in, in, uh, in hotels, restaurants, and shops, and mainly what is generally labeled as, as horeca, which is hotels, restaurants, and cafes, that should also have a significant impact. 16% are in the service in the service sector and 11% are in manufacturing. 350,000 companies are um, working on the SME platform for the Ministry of Economy are actually considered as SMEs and they provide 86% of the private sector total workforce. Um, this shows that uh, if SMEs are not supported in this environment, um, the employment would be also um, impacted since the SME sector provides around 86% of the total private sector um, uh, jobs. 60% of the UAE contribution um, um, in, into non-oil GDP comes from, uh, from SMEs. So um, having that significant contribution and SMEs being curtailed in their activity would cause a significant impact to GDP when we try to, uh, to see what, what could potentially be the impact. Um, Largest, um, the largest funding go flowing into the SME sec sector is still coming from, from the banks. The banks contribute um, uh, around 11% uh, of, of the total loans that they contribute are, are to the corporate sector, and 5.8% um, um, uh, of the total loans given by banks are given to SMEs in the UAE. And these figures are by the end of 2019. Um, what we can take from this is, given all the economic challenges that uh, that are being put in place by COVID-19, given the slow um, and the low exposure by banks to um, to uh, to the SME sector, 5.8% um, uh, would not cause a big systemic risk for that sector in general. But that said, banks are still the largest provider of capital. To the SME sector, so making sure they're they, they're in good shape and they have enough enough liquidity is is, is fairly critical. Um, just to highlight uh, all the measures that have been put in place, um, there isn't a single government in the GCC that hasn't put a, a sizable stimulus in place to support the economy and predominantly um, directed to uh, to SMEs and preserve employment. Um, the, the uh, Dubai government has announced 1.5 billion, around 400, uh, 409 million dollars of stimulus um, as of the 12th, uh, the 12th of March. Um, it had 15 different initiatives. Each initiative is detailed for uh, for every sector, and it's uh, widely available across um, all the official means of um, uh, communication by the government. Uh, one of the key measures, we try to focus as much as possible on the measures that are uh, aimed at SMEs, given how important and how big they are um, within the UAE economy and mainly uh, with respect to the non-oil non uh, economy in the UAE. Um, there has been um, announcements for roughly around 10% discount on, 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 on utility bills and waivers um, on down payments across all three zones uh, for trade licenses and installments. Um, uh, and also flexibility in terms of paying uh, all the um, um, all the, the the licenses for uh, for SMEs in general. The UAE has also uh, the UAE central bank has incentivized all banks to moderate any potential enforcement uh, action against SMEs. Um, this uh, this measure has been extended till till September. Um, free zones have also lowered or suspended fees for. Um, for renewals, um, that, that to facilitate SMEs uh, continuing as a going concern. Um, one program that has been announced by the central bank, which is uh, a very important one uh, and uh, has been labeled um, the targeted economic support scheme. Um, it's a program announced by the UAE central bank to make sure that the banks continue providing uh, loans and support to, uh, to SMEs in the region. And uh, that's a fairly important one uh, because um, given the economic challenges that are happening, if, if, uh, if you add to that um, a, a shortage of, of, uh, of liquidity or funding, it could, uh, it could spiral the, the crisis even more. Um, and uh, these are lessons learned from the global financial crisis when um, uh, a liquidity issue became a solvency issue and a solvency issue became an employment issue and, and it spiraled into 
uh, a much larger uh, crisis. So given all of these lessons, the government have put in uh, this program to make sure that liquidity is, is still um, widely available for, for all SMEs. There's also uh, around 100 billion uh, dirhams that have been that have been allocated to uh, to to credit and capital support to the banks. Um, there is a 50 billion tranche um, that will be distributed as a zero percent interest uh, collateralized uh, collateralized loans uh, for banks operating in UAE. Um, these are loans that uh, could be utilized for COVID impacted firms, um, and um, they will carry a zero percent interest. 50, 50 billion, another 50 billion has been allocated to free up uh, to free up liquidity buffers for banks. So parts of um, of the strict, uh, all the UAE banks are are very well capitalized, and they've been actually holding excess capital relative to uh, the minimum requirements uh, by the central bank. Uh, the, the 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 central bank has freed up uh, around 50 billion of of liquidity there just by re reducing part of the capital requirements. Um, to, to make sure that all the banks have enough liquidity and are incentivized to continue lending. Uh, as of April 20th, um, this program has been utilized up to 30%. So already one third has been, um, has been given out as, uh, as, as loans um, and, and, and support. So um, it's, a, it's evidence that this program is working um, because within one, one month, uh, actually less than one month of its announcement, it, uh, it's been 30% deployed. There are also talks to, to have it topped up uh, and increased further to support, um, to support the, uh, the economic recovery when coming out of, of, of COVID. Um, there's also uh, different measures that have been announced by each emirate. So um, the emirate of Abu Dhabi has announced uh, a 3 billion dirhams allocated uh, as, as investments through, through Abu Dhabi Investment Office. Also, across all federal entities and, and government entities, the, 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 a measure that was widely implemented, which is bid bonds and performance guarantees, have been waived for projects up to 50 million. So, all projects um, that SMEs can bid for that are below below 50 million don't uh, require any more bid bonds or performance guarantee to stimulate the sector. So, all of this package of measures um, is, is evident just to uh, highlight the support that will be provided for SMEs. I think it's important also to ask a question after this, that how, how, big, um, how big is that program and is it enough? Um, we've, uh, we've taken a comparison um, uh, of, um, of all uh, programs and stimulus packages adopted globally. It's pretty clear that the largest program announced so far, um, just by the, the numbers, uh, is, is in the U.S. Uh, the U.S. Is, so far has uh, has implemented 11 percent um, stimulus relative to its GDP uh, to support the economy um, and to uh, to uh, to prepare um, to prepare for the recovery. Um, also, an important data point: if you if we want to compare uh, uh, the amount of stimulus put in place now uh, compared to what has been done in the global financial crisis. Uh, it's pretty much uh, non-comparable. Uh, we are at the beginning of this um, of the COVID impact, and already um, we've exceeded um, all the fiscal easing um, that has been done uh, during the global financial crisis in the U.S. The amounts have, have are actually uh, almost getting close to to double the fiscal uh, the fiscal impact. The only puzzle or um, the only uh, bad student in the classroom per se is is in the euro area where for some reason uh, the fiscal easing is still lagging behind because governments are still unable to agree on a, on a broad EU scheme that will, uh, that will allow all, of, all European countries to have, uh, to have enough support. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the average globally for, for fiscal easing um, and to support the economies is around 6% relative to 5% 5 uh, in the global financial crisis. Um, in the UAE uh, and how the UAE stacks up, uh, around 6% of, of, of the GDP is just uh, the test program alone, excluding all other programs, which means um, all the programs in place um, would add up to a much higher figure than, uh, than the current 6% of GDP. 
So the test program has been made as um, equivalent to in line with the kind of the global average, but adding all the other programs, uh, we would exceed um, in the fiscal easing that has been put in place. The, the key risk here is the execution of that program. Um, it has to be, uh, it's, it, which is very critical. Um, it has to be done in a very swift manner. Uh, we've already seen that the part 30% of the test program has been already deployed. Um, there could be, there are already talks to, to extend that to other sectors. Um, the key additional uh, features that have been added to that are not only linked to, to dollar value or, or investment, there are uh, also the, um, lower capital requirements for loans to SMEs. So the central bank has issued guidelines um, uh, allowing uh, lower lower capitalized uh, SMEs to to apply for loans. There, there has been also um, an increase uh, in in LTV for uh, loan to values for 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 first time mortgages by five percent. So what that means is part of the measures that have been made to support indirectly uh, the real estate sector is um, previously for first-time mortgages, um, the LTV could not exceed 75%. There is a measure now allowing uh, banks to increase that to 80% uh, and subject to, the, to the, the internal risk measures of every bank. Um, higher, the higher exposure is um, up to 30%. So before, um, uh, banks would, uh, were allowed to lend uh, up to 20% of their balance sheet to real estate. Um, this limit has been increased to 30%. So um, they've, in, they've technically incentivized all banks in the UAE to lend even more to the real estate sector by increasing their limit exposure. There is also a, a reduction in merchant discount rate, which is a more relevant measure for, uh, for SMEs. Um, which means that basically the average fees charged on uh, on on online or payments uh, given that smes are uh, now if they their only source of majority source of of business is online so merchant discount rates have been have been reduced there's also a cap on fees that have been put in place um, in terms of what fees can be can be charged for SMEs uh, by by banks? So that that cap has been has, uh, has already been put in place. Um, so all of all of these measures, just to highlight that there is a, a serious incentives and there are lesson, lessons uh, lessons learned from the previous crisis um, that um, that are pushing uh, pushing governments to act as quickly and as swiftly as possible to support um, the 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 economic uh, the economic environment in, in their respective countries. One, one ray of hope um, um, that is planned is we, that support is still expected to continue until we have a, a formal riddance of, of, of COVID-19. Um, if to highlight that uh, in, in Q1 this year, there's an organization called CEPI, um, which is a, a, a central organization that centralizes research for, for vaccines globally. They're based out of Norway. Um, within the, the first quarter of this year, they've, uh, they've gathered north of 30 billion of funding, uh, 30 billion dollars of funding to support vaccine research for COVID-19 globally. It's the highest ever amount spent in research for, for vaccines in one quarter. Um, if uh, by according to Milken Institute uh, tracking uh, figures, uh, there is around 197 treatments uh, and treatment subcategories uh, that are being currently researched uh, to to treat COVID-19, and also 111 vaccine candidates. Each one of them are in different stages of of, of research and development. There's also a positive news here um, that. Um, uh, while all of that research is taking place, there's also a significant effort to make sure that we have enough production capacity that aims at, um, uh, at uh, ramping up production of vaccine doses whenever, whenever the, uh, the, the vaccine has been vetted. So uh, until that process is, 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 is finalized and is clear, once we have a clear treatment and a clear or, and or a clear vaccine, um, they, 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 the economic challenges are still going to be there and, and, and they, they will prevail. Um, 
if we if we look at the current state of investments and where we are, um, just tracking um, the data provided by Google, we use the, the the Google Mobility Report, which is available online, that gathers data from um, Google Maps and the different apps that Google has. We see that um, activity for parks and, and and public parks has declined 71%. Uh, 61 percent for retail and and recreation that's basically footfall numbers in q1 relative to to last year um, 57 percent decline in workplaces um, the the average across the board is roughly around 42 uh, percent decline in activity that's in q1 alone one key figure here to highlight is um, the bulk of the lockdown and the curtailment has happened in q2 um, most of the uh, lockdown and curfews and, and, and limitations in movements to flatten the curve for COVID have happened uh, mid-March or end of March. So we expect Q2 figures to, to be, uh, or the second quarter figures to be uh, slightly worse than, um, than, than Q1 before recovering uh, later on. The GCC average is roughly around 31%. Um, and uh, Saudi Arabia is 38%, and in Bahrain, that has the least um, amount of of, um, of strict measures, the, the, the decline was around 21%. Um, the one thing to highlight is um, the COVID shock did not come in at the best of times because Q1, um, Q1 in the UAE economy was already slowing down due to a variety of economic uh, economic factors. One of them is there was a slowdown in global trade because of the trade war between the U.S. and China by late last year um, that, that was already disrupting supply chains and most of the large corporates were, uh, were trying to uh, re review their supply chain plans by shifting some of the production out of China. Uh, this COVID crisis has happened in the midst of, of, of all of that in addition to geopolitical tensions and also um, a slowdown of, 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 of uh, of trade resulting in a slowdown of investments. Um, this all brings us to a key, a key thing that um, an economic contraction um, is literally unavoidable this year. Um, uh, the best of estimates, uh, which are looking uh, slightly positive now, is to have uh, non-oil non GDP shrinking by roughly around uh, 5% this year. This assumes that all the fiscal measures that have been put in place do work efficiently and timely. In addition to um, a, a yeah, without for a, a, an extension of these measures for the second uh, second quarter of this year, if these measures are not extended, then the, the GDP could shrink more than five percent. This is obviously worse than than 2008 and the global financial crisis, which was much slower to. Uh, to happen and to materialize. Um, all of that said, there are no no serious concerns over the macro stability on the peg or uh, the peg of UAE dirham or US dollar, as per um, our view and most of our discussions with all our investment partners. Um, the there is also no issue in terms of the UAE being able to fund or finance the deficit of of 10% this year, um, and these are the estimates roughly because of the drop in oil prices as well as the stimulus spending that is taking place. There are no issues in, in financing that. Um, Abu Dhabi has already uh, tapped the market. They raised $7 billion um, in, uh, in April, despite the drop in oil prices at very attractive rates. And that issue was more than more than three times oversubscribed. So, they got a demand of north of 20 billion when the target was to raise 7 billion. So there's no issue there in terms of the ability to fund all of these programs um, without tapping into uh, the sovereign wealth fund reserves and, uh, and the government uh, ample resources. Uh, one key issue here is that fiscal um, uh, fisc fiscal deficit is, is, is dependent also on oil prices. The budget uh, for the beginning of this year has been set at the roughly a break-even of $86. The current price is $29, and uh, this is just the latest price, but the average price for the last two months has been much lower because uh, oil prices were at a lower level for most of that period. So just to highlight, this is the, the, the broad macro environment in which we're operating in. 
And the key indicator for the level of distress that is happening is when we track uh, when we track information from um, all the banks. Um, lucky enough, uh, Emirates and BD, which is the largest bank uh, in Dubai and uh, one of the largest operators of within the retail and SME sectors, has announced their figures. The figures are public, and it's a publicly traded company. One key metric that we follow just to monitor the level of distress um, in uh, in the SME uh, market is we look at increase in provisions and, and exposures. Uh, the bank and as per IFRS requirements, they categorize they categorize the the, the loan exposures in three stages. So stage three is um, for all loans that are in excess of 90 days. Um, where uh, the uh, the customer has not has had some difficulty in in paying uh, and is under monitoring for for the last 90 days and have not gotten back to a normal pace of repayment of the loans. So stage stage one loans um, um, have not uh, have not skyrocketed or increased significantly, but the bulk of the increase was in stage two, which means that banks. Um, that banks were monitoring a lot of loans already that were in stage one and not expecting them to go to stage two right away, which means that um, for the next two months, the majority of small corporates or SMEs will struggle in terms of servicing their loans for at least another two months. Um, they have, on the other side, increased provisions significantly, so which means um, banks um, do take a provision as mandated by central bank whenever all the loans are doubtful. Uh, the amount of total provisions incre have increased by 52%, so roughly the total amount of provision taken so far um, is around 2.5 billion dirhams for, um, for Emirates and BD alone, which is a very significant amount compared to last year. Also, uh, the bulk of that provisioning is focused on stage two loans, which means loans that have uh, have had already skips for one month and are getting and 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 have skipped for the second month in terms of payments. Um, this figure ha is is um, is has been announced by the bank that uh, it could significantly increase for the for the rest of the year, just highlighting the economic uh, the economic distress that is happening within SMEs uh, in the in the in the country. Um, in the middle of all of that, um, we, we still see uh, investment opportunities in the UAE that are happening, especially within, within the SME and startup uh, uh, space. There are significant opportunities that are, that are materializing. But before we get there, um, we just want to go over um, what has changed in terms of, um, in, in, in terms of um, new trends for customers. So, how are um, our customers looking at and what are they looking at uh, now? So we utilized a couple of surveys from, uh, from leading, uh, leading experience research firms and brand experience research firms. So the, the first key, key metric is uh, most of the store setup and retail uh, is going to be based on a, a, a look and not touching context. So um, checking products to pay for them um, is, is not going to be allowed. It, we're going to be more into a world of, of, of contactless where cash uh, as a mean of transaction is losing market share and preference to use cards and uh, other, other means of payment is going to be more, 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 uh, more abundant and, and will be the norm. Uh, protecting personal space is, is going to be even more critical. So social distancing in any store uh, is not going to be a, an option. Um, shopping local is more important. So basically, um, for any mall or retail or business that's going to open, uh, figuring out um, the close demand uh, of your customers nearby is going to be fairly important. So location is is going to be an issue. Um, and um, the preference highlighted by most customers is is shopping locally compared to uh, to uh, to going far distances or uh, or global. That's also assuming that lockdowns um, get uh, get released pretty quickly and people are are uh, are not subjected to curfews going forward. They would still favor or prefer to shop local. Um, the discretionary spending is dropping, and that's a trend globally, not only in in UAE. So 
priority will always be for necessities, groceries, households, essentials, and, and of course the um, uh, discretionary spending can wait. So anything, uh, including the next uh, the next model of a smartphone or upgrade, uh, an upgrade consumption is is is, is delayed for now. Um, everything is 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 going virtual, including uh, the, this uh, this this new mean of communication. So. Uh, from meetings to learning to uh, even exercising and in, 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 in sports and gyms have, have started offering uh, online uh, exercises and, and uh, online gain and online market share is, is exceedingly rampant compared to offline. Um, any retail right now with no online presence is, is, is bound to, uh, to disappear. Um, so the whole focus in terms of Customers and, and, and customer comfort, comfort with um, with online shopping and e-commerce is, is is even there, including um, B2B and B2C. So that's a trend that has been there for quite some time. Um, this uh, a, a virus has has helped accelerate that trend even more. Um, loyal brands um, will be even more important. So the focus will be on safety first. Um, cleanliness in stores, sanitizing, um, the green economy will take a back seat um, as the humanity is more focused on survival and the customer is, is, will consider cleanliness in stores and sanitizing as more important. Um, across the whole retail chain, there's also an abundance and of reuse of, of, of plastic bags, so people have stopped uh, basically recycling there just uh, for obvious reasons to avoid the spread of the virus. There are also uh, globally driven decisions that are taking more and more uh, um, a front seat. So uh, everyone is more conscious where their goods are sourced from, produced, transparency also on the global supply chain. So um, even more uh, corporates now are focused on um, making their supply chain even more, um, even more um, uh, even more e efficient with less buffer um, and with actually more buffer at this point in time. So just in time and uh, lean supply chains are, are bound to disappear. Um, the, 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 the focus on uh, optimizing cost is not anymore the priority. Um, having transparency on the full supply chain is even more important. Um, and also uh, deadlines and, and delay in deliveries is even more important as well as um, all the all the scrutiny that will happen by by customers in the in the current environment. So these are the key trends that uh, that the new customer post post COVID are and the key changes that uh, that we believe are happening. Um, the other part is across the whole investment opportunities. There are key themes that are happening. So um, as well as uh, three main investment conclusions that we believe are, are, are going to be there for, for with us for quite some time. We're obviously entering a new economic cycle, uh, which is completely different than the one that we've had before, um, where we, we still believe that valuations are going to be expanding. So uh, we were at uh, in an environment where it became pretty normal for a startup or a large startup. Um, uh, our um, are, are priced at, uh, at exorbitant figures. We believe we will come back to that environment, but that's driven by central banks and mainly the leading one, which is the Fed uh, injecting so much liquidity so quickly and dropping interest rates. Um, there will also be a high level of, of debt by the government. So unfortunately, that much liquidity and that much uh, interest rate uh, is, is necessary to finance, uh, to finance the fiscal deficit happening globally. So levels of debt are, are, are going to significantly increase by large corporates and by governments. Um, from a macro, long-term macro perspective, this is a risk, but short-term, it's, it's not a risk. This, this will put us in a, in a very low inflation environment. Um, we will continue to, to move into the digital world and the digital revolution will, will even more amplify. We will be in even more diversified supply chain. So any company, for example, uh, your next Apple is gonna eventually cost more. Your next uh, smartphone or laptop is gonna cost more just because uh, each of these corporates is gonna start planning even more capacity or leeway in their supply chain and that will have a cost effect that they'll have to, uh, to monetize. The good thing also is 
their ability to pass on these, these costs is going to be much much lower because we're coming into an environment where uh, which is pretty weak where um, uh, bargaining power and consume and consumption power is much lower because of the challenges on employment and um, coming down from coming up uh, out of uh, of a recession that will take time for us to recover um, there will be more consolidation and and, and m a uh, we've had our fair share of, of, of that in the UAE with banks consolidating massively. There will also be a greater focus on, on, social, uh, on the social contract, on ESG and corporate governance. Um, the social contract is every single company will, will be scrutinized how they treat their employees um, and, their, uh, and their customers and stakeholders pre-post-COVID. Uh, all of that will result in, in three main key, key things when, when looking at investments, at least from um, uh, from, uh, from a global perspective. And this has been shared by several um, um, several investment funds that we speak to. Growth is going to be even more um, scarce. Um, it's very it's going to be even more challenging to find uh, large corporates or small ones or or uh, even SMEs that can generate growth as significantly as before. Um, income will remain uh, scarce, so high dividend payments because of the low interest rates environment um, will be increased in terms of valuation. So it, 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 it's going to be even more challenging to have uh, high yielding assets from real estate to, to, to stocks to um, ability of companies to pay even more dividends. Um, debt levels will be higher. Um, and of course, uh, in that, in an environment like that, companies that can grow faster with a cleaner balance sheet would uh, would warrant even more interest. Um, the key thing is we will take what that means um, across a variety of sectors. So um, uh, across the board, um, uh, there are sectors that we believe are key beneficiaries in this part of the world and in our region. Um, and the key theme here is the on-demand economy versus old economy. These are sectors that on-demand economy is obviously going to gain even more market share, and that applies to any sector you can think of. The stay-home economy, which is which has just appeared um, pretty quickly, and we've already seen globally a key trend of, of, of a lot of corporates and new startups trying to take advantage of that. The experience economy will still be there with a more focus on, on, on safety. If we drill deeper on each one, uh, I mean, it's predominantly for, um, for healthcare, I think the, health, the regional healthcare industry is due for, uh, for a revolution and for bridging the gap. It's still it's, it's surprisingly challenging and, and, and strange for us. Um, it should not be more difficult to, to, to order a pizza than to get a, to see a doctor or have a prescription. It should be on demand and smooth. And there are a lot of companies uh, uh, globally that are considering an entrance uh, to the region. In the retail, in the retail side, um, retail will be challenged and um, the physical retail will be even more challenged. But the last, uh, but it, it's due also for a revolution. Last mile delivery will be key um, to 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 support the whole growth in e-commerce. Um, in addition to um, subscription e-commerce and specialty retail, um, there are concepts that are happening globally that are gaining and getting market share compared to the the whole supermarket concept where you go to an Amazon and order everything you can think of, um, and um, the, the 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 whole retail concept is getting the second stage of that and that we expect to see in the region is is more uh, subscription e-commerce where for example uh, grooming for men and or or uh, female uh, female hygiene uh, we pretty much know that we we shave x amount per week etc so you'll have that subscribed and then um, your e-commerce provider or your e-commerce platform will supply whatever you need, whenever you need it on a, on a monthly or timely basis. Um, the key here also um, that uh, one, one of the industries that, uh, that we believe is due for, um, for, a, for a revolution and, 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 and will quickly close the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the technology gap is marketing and events. Um, events and large gatherings are going to be banned and are going to be considered risky uh, for quite some time at least by customers even if they're allowed all of a sudden um, 
So the use and the organization of events is going to be even more critical and challenged. Um, um, marketing and event management companies are, are going to have to figure out a way uh, to, uh, to do that. And I think we've seen leads from what's happening globally where events are more um, online but structured on, on, on data uh, derived from social media and research platforms. Um, and uh, in the presentation, there are examples of, of, of companies that leverage that. So uh, StubHub and Viagogo are, are um, two large companies that have, one, merged right before the COVID-19 crisis, and have also announced that they're going to migrate all of their event platform uh, to a data-driven event organization. So any event that, does, that, that will be on that platform will be sold um, uh, predominantly online and will be designed using data derived from social media. Um, so that could lead me to my next point, which, which is that social media are becoming more and more as data supermarkets. So um, for marketing research, uh, companies will have to adapt there. And we, we, we already see a, a plethora of companies coming to tap into that. And we believe that trend is, is, is going to expand to the region pretty soon, where uh, companies are going to aim at uh, implementing an active social listening uh, strategy whereby they gather data from social media, which are acting as, as data supermarkets. So each company uh, to know exactly how their customer feel, what is the typology of their customers, what, what do they like, what do they don't like, um, of course, with the full respect of privacy, uh, et cetera, but, but most of that um, industry is going to be focused on, on data and data management and will be data driven. Um, marketing research and marketing companies and, and event management companies will have to adopt uh, that to, to, uh, to adapt to the new world. Real estate also as an industry will, will significantly change. All of a sudden, we realize that we can we can work from home. It's not it's not impossible, uh, and we can work efficiently from home. Coming back to the office, the, being present and physically present in an office is going to become uh, less and less of a necessity. There are already companies that have announced that uh, they, they 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 are considering authorizing their employees to work for from home indefinitely. Um, this trend is going to continue. Um, it will have an impact on the real estate, obviously. So being central and downtown and uh, and closer to your office is not any more a necessity. Um, in certain reports that we've seen are uh, that uh, even some uh, some demand on real estate as far of, as far away from the city as possible uh, could be expected. Um, uh, that that basically uh, could have an issue. Uh, across real estate pricing uh, going forward. It's also an industry that is due for a disruption. Um, we could, uh, there are already models of owning uh, real estate fractionally, um, which means that um, we could consider a plan where a, a person could use um, real estate uh, in line with what Airbnb is doing, but at the same time, on top of that, adding a layer of owning real estate fractionally where a group of investors can easily own one single unit or one single sort of property. Um, the same applies for uh, banking uh, investments um, where uh, a lot of industry uh, trends there are based on security issues, KYC and heavy processes are, are now easily facilitated with technology. And education is, is, is one that's has been noticing a slow, a slow revolution, where, but now e-learning is, is there and it's not going to disappear anytime soon. Um, streaming is one key sector where the region is lagging behind. Um, we, st we have yet to see providers of content um, for streaming platforms globally that are from the region, that know the region very well, that um, know the taste. I mean, there are efforts uh, to other platforms that have started mainly sponsored by old media, um, but um, that's something that, uh, that will eventually uh, um, kickstart in the region and there are already talks uh, by some telecom companies to start their own streaming platforms and then the second step would be uh, the content part. These are all sectors that we believe will notice significant um, trend and that uh, are worth considering and where the region is going to close a technology gap sooner or later. 
um, uh, now the next phase is, is basically what SMEs should uh, should do to attract investment investor appetite in this in this in this environment. Um, uh, the 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 interesting the interesting thing is, um, of course, investors um, in in that environment would be even more cautious than a, than a than a COVID uh, than pre-COVID uh, environment for obvious reasons. Um, where liquidity is is is, is going to be challenged and uh, and valuations are challenged at least in the short term, but that does not mean that the whole investment world is is is, is shut. Um, um, the other the other uh, the other most important thing is before approaching investors, it's very important to map them to know all types of investors by size, type, and ge geography. As well as uh, sector sector preference and investment process, there are uh, databases like uh, Prequin or Burgess or Cambridge Associates that uh, that provide a decent amount of support. Um, and these are um, these are uh, databases that are widely available, and they could offer that type of intelligence um, for uh, for uh, for SMEs or invest or, or uh, platform seeking investments and how to approach investors. The other, the other, um, the other most important uh, part is you need to choose your investor carefully. Um, uh, not all dollars uh, are equal, as they say. Um, some investors are, are would always choose to invest in companies in which they they will provide uh, value add rather than uh, passive or active investors. Um, or supportive investors to uh, to SMEs and, and and corporates are even more uh, interesting compared to a passive investor that will just provide simple a simple check. Um, that discussion has to be there, and um, of course, and that's where the mapping the mapping by size, by geography, and by investment process is also very critical. Uh, one thing to note is that uh, fundraising is generally a process. It will become even more of a process now than before. Um, there are there is a variety of of, of fundraising uh, structures that could be implemented, from safe notes to to convertible to a simple equity injection. So choosing which one and the one that fits the most uh, the SME before engaging with the investor is very important. Um, what investors there is enough um, enough in, instability and uncertainty in, in the investment world. Uh, if, if a corporate comes in without, or, or an SME, or comes in seeking investment without knowing exactly what they need, it could be uh, badly perceived or frowned, frowned upon from 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 investors. Um, you, you have to be very specific, um, meaning you should know exactly how much you want to raise, uh, the size of the funding required, the timing required, um, and the format. Um, and the critical thing is. Um, Right now, what we're noticing, um, I, we obviously um, see conversations that don't pan out well, but the most of the ones that, um, that do pan out quite well are um, ones that uh, uh, start with significant flexibility from the SME or the entrepreneur, and where a uh, discussion is, is more open, though the, the entrepreneur would know exactly what they want and what they need in an optimal, in an optimal environment. The critical thing also is to be ready to undergo scrutiny, um, to be checked and cross-checked in terms of business plan. Um, um, be ready also to change the terms of the of the funding significantly. It's never never the case that uh, the initial terms in a fundraise are the same one uh, the same ones at the end. Um, the other most important one is to also prepare for a contingency plan, which means uh, that if you're planning to, tar to fundraise in three months, it could take much longer. Um, it's, it, could be, it could take way more longer than planned, so having, having a contingency plan uh, in place is, is critical. There are cases where it takes uh, a shorter period of time, and we've seen, we've seen uh, events where that happened. Um, also, preparing for a, a plan A and B and C is, is, is also important. So, for example, we've seen situations where uh, startups or, or uh, in the private equity space or SMEs trying to raise, to raise funds from investors 
um, and uh, wanting the full amount to be to be invested right away without actually a clear explanation on why that would be required. Um, that's why uh, being ready to stagger uh, in a staggered milestone approach is is is, is even more going to be the norm than before. So, uh, and what I mean by that is um, subject to uh, the company or the management of the company achieving certain milestones, they will be entitled to to draw an additional amount of, of, of capital and funding. Um, the most important part is to be fully prepared also before approaching investors. So having a, a, and not hesitating to utilize the, the, the full scale of technology um, data rooms now are widely available, so Dropbox, uh, from Dropbox to Box to even Google, Google to uh, each one of these provides a, 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 a data room solution, so using it to prepare all every single um, documentation uh, that could be asked by investors is very important, um, from a clear business plan to all the data backing, to conservative assumptions being utilized, and putting all of that in an organized data room is, is, is becoming the norm. Um, and it's gonna become even more uh, the norm going forward. Um, the most important uh, additional points are relate to providing a clear structure of, of governance. So having a clear organizational structure, a board in place, an advisory board in place is also important. Um, one thing that will become less, and we've seen that uh, happening more, um, uh, you don't want to be taking a key man risk in an, in, an, in an SME format, so the focus is more on teams uh, and, and a balanced organizational and governance structure. Um, and in addition to the early end points of providing as much, um, as much detail uh, in terms of business plan as, as, as possible. Um, aligning uh, the interest fully, uh, and it's a very, very tricky, uh, tricky exercise uh, with with those of the investors is, is very important. One cannot be seen to be making um, um, to be making a a um, a, uh, a lot of money with risk in comparison to the, to the investors down the line. So that 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 structure of aligning the interest, be it in terms of expensing or salaries or returns later on uh, is also important. And by the way, it goes both ways uh, going forward. So entrepreneurs and investors have to make sure that uh, their interests are fully aligned. Any misalignment there um, ends up in most of the time um, in, in, in a bad experience. Um, majority of, of, of SMEs do fail um, um, when they want to raise, uh, raise capital. But the reason of failure um, is, is, is more or less the same. It's, it's either financial planning that has been uh, not done in place, uh, working capital, or projected runway in terms of funding uh, was not enough, or lack of, of oversight of governance. The key risk is, uh, I mean, the, the outcome from all of these is the financial loss, but the financial loss sometimes, if it's planned for and, and, and announced and discussed in openly with investors, is, is actually acceptable. We are in, in companies that we see that they will continue to lose money and we stepped in in this environment and, and supported them also uh, as long as it's part of a clear plan and, uh, and, and a clear, and there are many examples of companies that have lost money for years and, and, and uh, became successful later on. So having, having that, um, that structure uh, and that plan in place uh, is, is very important. Uh, the critical thing is not to be uh, overly aggressive and uh, announce profitability too early and uh, not achieve it and that could derail the whole funding plan and then eventually cause uh, cause failure um, the last part is um, to differentiate between two things i think there is uh, an exercise that has to be done by every investor or, or an every sme before approaching a fundraise Tracking investor allocations is, is very important. Um, I'll try just to summarize that very briefly. There are multiple sources there for, uh, from Prequin to Cambridge Associates to other data providers that will give you a clear, a clear state of, of, of the market in terms of why, where are family offices trying to allocate, where are private equity 
Um, and just to highlight, uh, there, is, there are important figures to track, which are the dry powder, which is basically the amount of cash available by private equity funds and venture capital, as well as funding platforms in, this, um, in, in the UAE, uh, as well as uh, the same pattern in, in, in the GCC. So, um, and, and, this, and, and that will automatically allow you to, to look at um, the different structures of, of, of how to raise capital. There is one source of funding that was not that popular pre-COVID that we believe is going to become even more popular. We could see a trend of, of M&A and consolidation. I mean, it's not a word that is only applicable to large corporates. There are also uh, small startups um, and small companies that have just started that are and should be willing to consider consolidation and, 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 and M&A. And we have participated in, 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 small, uh, in small fundings that plan to do that. That, um, that overall idea is um, this is another source of capital that, that, that should be considered when planning for, for funding. What we've seen is that typically SMEs or entrepreneurs do not consider that as, a, as an option. Going forward, I think it's, it's a critical one. Um, just to highlight here uh, some, some of the data that is widely available. Uh, there is a tracking of the number of, of investors that volunteer and provide their intel uh, to these platforms and are easily easily reachable. So um, one key message here is the allocation that investors or diversified portfolios are willing to to do to uh, to alternatives are increasing, which is a good a good thing for uh, for SMEs and for startups. So private equity and venture capital and private debt. Um, are considered generally alternatives. Uh, the average holding there has been around 3% of, of, of portfolios and that data is provided by Prequin. Uh, the plan is to increase that to around 6%. So there is uh, more of private capital willing to, uh, to get involved into the alternative space. The amount of dry powder has also significantly increased to, to, to 7 billion. Um, the bulk of investors in the, mid in the Middle East are mainly investment companies um, anywhere in the world. Um, uh, anywhere in the world, uh, that may not be the case because uh, it's, it's inefficient to set up a company that just does investments uh, somewhere else. But because of the uh, positive tax taxation environment in this part of the world, um, investment companies which act as a proxy for family offices uh, in reality. One key part here about uh, the importance of corporate governance uh, for SMEs and why um, it, it, is, it is important, it, it typically facilitates um, due diligence and also fundraising. There is also a technicality here that, uh, that is perceived by SMEs that they, or, or startups. They believe that boards or executive committees are, or, um, uh, or, or sub Subcommittees within a company are, are, are the property of, of large corporates or organized. This is not the case. Uh, small SMEs have, have converged to this type of governance very early in the cycle, and it's been a positive contributor to their success. Uh, there isn't all the, all the large companies now that have started over, over the last seven or eight years from Facebook to Google to even local examples from Kareem to um, Okadok or that were able to raise funding have organized themselves uh, very early uh, in the cycle and have utilized the fully transparent governance uh, structure with uh, using independent board, using advisory boards. An advisory board is an important tool because in reality it's, uh, it's, it's, advi it's free advice uh, rather than hiring uh, an expensive consultant. So that's, that's an important point. It also guilt, ha, helps in a fundraising exercise to, to avoid inherent biases, which are basically uh, buyers of, of a product are always, uh, are always optimistic and, and have unrealistic assumptions. And also um, sellers um, are typically either uh, want to high price because they believe that their, their product or their company is, is um, is, is, is too good to be sold at any valuation. Uh, the critical thing also is once you have this, the governance structure in place and cross-checking uh, uh, and a balanced decision-making, it's very, it's very 
it's very easy to 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 avoid these uh, these biases. Incentive uh, misalignment. So it's 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 another another area where the incentive scheme, if they are vetted by a third party and it's not the same entrepreneur or the key man that takes all the decisions in the company, uh, you could end up in a situation where these are not taken into consideration. Um, of course, um, a board and executive committees in place would would once they vet the numbers, it, it's it even more uh, more challenging to have inaccurate financial in, information. Uh, being reported or uh, non-proper accounting or anything as such. Um, it also helps in negotiation uh, in the key man risk or entrepreneurs, um, but from experience, um, have the tendency to badly negotiate the transaction. Um, from a, and also um, having one committee or a group of people looking at the risk is, is better than, than, than one pair of eyes. Um, just to just to highlight um, basically what company should prepare for going forward, and that's the the, the last part of my of my presentation is basically uh, I've tried to categorize businesses into uh, either B two B, so companies that focus on servicing businesses, or B two C, or uh, companies that focus on both. Um, so as a, as a summary, uh, managing the balance sheet is a critical element. Um, so focusing on having ample liquidity in place and avoiding the trap. If, if SMEs were, were coming into the COVID crisis with just one month of working capital, um, it's going to be a very dire situation for them at the current point in time. So making sure that uh, there is always a buffer there is, is, is fairly important. Um, um, you should also, if, you, if you're a, an SME focusing on servicing other businesses, you should be careful of, of, of businesses getting out of the COVID crisis and, and aiming at reducing spending um, and assuming that they will continue to spend the same way uh, pre-COVID should not be uh, the, the normal assumption. Um, try to raise funding debt or equity when you less need it um, because when you actually need it, it all of a sudden becomes more expensive. Um, always do your capital budget budgeting with a buffer and uh, digitalize uh, transform to online platforms as much as possible. Otherwise, um, you're bound to, if there is a second wave of, of, of COVID or any other uh, virus or crisis or health crisis, um, you're, you're, you're going to be exposed to the same to the same issues. Working capital management is key. Um, you know, uh, how you manage your payment terms with clients, with, uh, with suppliers is, is, is very, very important. And uh, capital preservation is going to be key in this period of crisis. Um, sacrificing margin to generate cash or generate growth is is actually preferable now uh, in an environment where we're going to be in an economically challenged environment for some time. If you are a B2C uh, uh, company, uh, being aware of the trends uh, and the consumer, the consumer change and the consumer behavior change that we discussed earlier is, is fairly important. Having an online presence is even more important now. Um, margin erosion is, is, is also going to be there, so um, don't expect to make the same margins for, uh, for, uh, for some time if you want to grow in the current environment. Managing the supply chain is, is even more important if you're, uh, if you're becoming uh, an online business. Um, and uh, making sure that you have the right, uh, the right setup from a supply chain perspective and the right delivery on time. Sourcing locally is, is going to be the trend um, and con consistently will become the key rather than sourcing the cheapest product. If you're a hybrid, i.e. a B2B and a B2C at the same time, of course, all of, all of the above applies. In addition to balance sheet becoming even more critical, because if you're dealing with a business and they want to tap you for credit terms or longer payment cycles as well as as a customer, then that's even more pressure for the balance sheet. Uh, having having a, a clearer online presence is important because you cannot have or you cannot deal with both entities online the same way. I think um, that pretty much concludes uh, my my my. Uh, webinar and uh, I'm happy to tackle any questions so uh, I will try to answer as much as possible without um, without uh, I'll try to ignore uh, to avoid ignoring any and uh, 
try to tackle as much as possible in the interest of time. So one of the questions uh, that I have is, will this be allocated? Will the test program be allocated to media-based companies and service-based companies? Um, yes, uh, I think there is a clear there is a clear distinction between uh, all of, all of these. As long as you have an existing banking relationship, uh, it's worth considering that. For example, most of the companies that we've invested in, we have a, we had an active discussion with them to approach all the all the banks. Uh, and to go ahead and uh, to seek as much clarity on the test program announced by the central bank and to tap into that. And if you see that program has been availed pretty quickly, it's already been used at 30%. So uh, there is no limitation on, on, on services or, or, uh, or media-based companies. Uh, the relationship is how, how good is the relationship with the bank to avail all of that support. Um, Uh, there is one question that says, okay, how startups which are into social marketing, sustainable products are facing the dilemma from economic drive um, startup where customer view, uh, views the price and does not want to pay sustainable products. Um, I think uh, just to, to, to deal with that in two, in two steps, I think that um, there is a change in, in, in customer behavior that is expected. Um, the more focus on safety is there. And I think transparency in pricing is also important um, and how you communicate to the customer is important. Uh, the key here is typically customers don't want to pay more if they don't have a clear transparency on pricing or clear visibility. So the pricing strategy has to be involved um, in to justify why uh, you're more expensive. If, if, for example, you run your competitive analysis and the typical case here is if uh, is, is between other Chinese manufacturers of smartphones and Apple. Uh, everyone knows why Apple is more expensive compared to other, other manufacturers and, and they provide enough um, visibility as to why, why they, they, they have a more expensive product and they don't mind, uh, some customers don't mind uh, actually paying the, paying the premium and others have another preference. Um, approaching that with, with, the, with the diversity of pricing options is always important and having uh, for an SME having and disclosing why you're pricing your product that way is, is going to be even more critical. And uh, the loyalty and the transparency is going to be even more important. We've had discussions where, for example, in a, in a typical case, I was in a, in a situation with a, with a company where we had a similar issue where another supplier of the same product decided to price the software at a fraction of the cost that we had. We, we had talks with customers as to uh, how how we can match their price, but and what would that mean in terms of quality costs and cuts and uh, lack of service? Some customers opted for the reduced service and the reduced pricing, and others opted not to not to do that. Um, uh, the other questions, I think, some of them have to do with other diseases not killing or not uh, impacting our lives as much as, as COVID. Uh, to be honest, I don't have the answer to that. Um, my my simple interpretation is we are where we are today because COVID is dangerous and it's impacting people. And rather than thinking why is it why are we here, etc., it's just a situation that I believe we should deal with and, and and move on. There are large and global efforts that are being made to cope with the situation. Um, uh, of course, that all of the investments we just wish that. Uh, we, we put the same effort equally for other diseases and other um, issues and deal with them the same way. The problem is I don't think we can afford to deal with them the same way because um, uh, we cannot afford to spend uh, $30 billion uh, in research for, for vaccines for every disease on a yearly basis. We could, uh, the, 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 the global economy cannot afford that. And we cannot afford to be in lockdowns whenever uh, a... Uh, an issue like this happens longer than where we've been. So I think uh, governments also will hit their limits. And I think uh, the way we deal with healthcare is going to be even more, uh, even more important going forward. Um, I think that's pretty much it uh, in terms of questions, unless I've, I've missed any other thing. Uh, thank you very much for your participation. And uh, uh, I hope you, uh, you enjoyed the webinar.